What's up guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we have another exciting walkthrough video for you. We are going to be looking through the appliances and the accessories on the Ibex 19 QBS. All right, Ibex are starting right up front. As always, we are going to go through that loadout procedure. This unit is going to utilize a two inch ball, so we're going to make sure we're outfitted with that before time of delivery. Uh, from there, we have our latch lock in the unlocked position. So the idea being is that we would back our two inch ball underneath this coupler, use our electric tongue jack to seat that coupler over top of that ball. Once we are fully seated, we are just going to pull that back. We are gonna make sure that this secondary latch is fully engaged. I always like to go back and give that a pull to make sure that that is nice and secure. And then we're gonna go ahead, add a secondary pin. What that's going to do is keep this from potentially rattling loose, coming disengaged, going down the road. Whether that's of the locking variant or just a spring clip, uh, either one will work in that scenario. We're then going to take our tow chains, cross those underneath the coupler, and make our connection onto the receiver, making sure we have enough room to make our turns left or right, but not so much room that these may make contact with the pavement. Riding right next to those tow chains is going to be our emergency breakaway cable. Now this is a very important piece of safety equipment. It's important that we utilize a third or separate connection point on the receiver. Uh, reason being is that if any of these other tow components were to become compromised, as the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system, uh, essentially keeping you from having a runaway camper scenario. So it is important that we do connect that separate of these other tow components. Right next to that, we are going to have our seven-way wiring. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's braking system, charging system, marker lights, tail lights, all that fun stuff. Again, make sure we have enough room uh, when this is plugged into your bumper receptacle to make our turns left to right, but not so much that this could, uh, you know, pull out of your bumper. Here we have our LCI electric tongue jack. Uh, does have a light there to give you a point of reference if you're backing up to the unit at dark time or uh, to go ahead and light uh, this area if you are going through that coupling procedure again after dark. And then we have a momentary switch here labeled extend and retract. Uh, of course, that corresponds with the direction of travel of that jack. And then we have a rubber plug back here on the top of the jack. If we were to go ahead and remove that, what that's going to expose is a three quarter inch drive nut. That will be the manual option for either loading and unloading the camper and you will use the corresponding crank handle to go ahead and accomplish that. And then directly behind that, we have a uh, 20 pound propane cylinder. This will be full for you at time of delivery, open and close valve on the top. I find generally most people are familiar with the operation of these. This is going to be the same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. It's up to you on whether you keep this tank with the unit or take advantage of any exchange programs or anything like that, or just remove it and have it filled. Uh, held in place with a tension band and a wing nut here. So if we're gonna go ahead and remove that tank for service, it's as easy as loosening up that wing nut, making sure our service valve is in the closed position, disconnecting the propane pigtail here, and lifting it out and having it serviced. Now this is all covered by your propane cover while going down the road. Uh, if you go ahead in here and look at this, you'll have a little hole there on the back. We're just gonna slip that over and line that hole up with this stud and then tighten that wing nut down over top of it to keep that from blowing off going down the road. Next up, we have our Group 24 Deep Cycle Battery. Uh, this is a lead acid battery, so what that means for you is it will go ahead and uh, take some maintenance. Uh, every 90 days, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels up. We're going to go ahead and inspect that water level and refill with distilled water as necessary. So we have a clear marked water level within that battery and we do just wanna maintain it. That's gonna go ahead and keep that battery uh, in good shape for longer. Uh, this is of course covered with this lid going down the road. So it's not something you're going to be taking a look at all the time, but just make sure that we are checking those water levels once every 90 days. Next up guys, while we're talking about that 12 volt system, we do have a battery disconnect switch uh, what we're going to use that for is periods of long-term storage. That's the best or easiest way to go ahead and isolate this battery from that 12-volt system. Reason being, again, is that you have 
Uh, with any 12 volt system, nominal or phantom draws on that system. Oftentimes it's like backlit displays and things like that. Um, just things that are gonna pull power that you may not be aware of. From the day to day, that's no big deal, but compounded over maybe some months in storage uh, can really wear and tear on the battery. So when we are entering the unit into storage, we do just wanna go ahead and disconnect this uh, switch here. It is clearly marked on off, uh, off of course being disconnected, on being connected. And then right beside that, we have our front stabilizer jack. Now you have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. These are going to be for stabilization, not for leveling. The idea being is that we get the unit within three degrees of level. From there, we then go ahead and run these down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more, just to sure everything up, keep you from feeling like you're walking around on the suspension of the trailer. And to do so, we're gonna go ahead and utilize again a three quarter inch drive crank handle here, and these are included with the unit. As we make our way around the side of the camper, of course, first things up is going to be your pass-through storage compartment. Now, all of these compartment doors are going to go ahead and utilize magnetic hold opens, which is a nice feature. You don't have to worry about this coming down uh, if you're sticking your head in the cabinet there. Um, also, they're just going to make it easy. Sometimes with the old style, like plastic clips, they degrade from the sun and, and more than likely they will break with use. You, of course, don't have to worry about that with these magnetic cold opens. Uh, also, we have an access panel removed here in the storage compartment. What that's going to expose uh, are some of our water system components. We have our 12 volt water pump here. Uh, one reason to mention it or get eyes on it is you do have an inline fuse. So uh, if that water pump were to do not work anymore, uh, we want to go ahead and remove this panel, check that fuse, make sure that is good there. And then also we have our vacuum line to add antifreeze into the system. So if we're doing a full winterization process, which we're going to uh, touch more on this as we go, but uh, in a full winterization process, you go ahead and dump all of the water from the unit. We then go back and replace that with some RV grade antifreeze. In that scenario, if we wanted to go ahead and do that, this is going to be our vacuum line to introduce that antifreeze into the system. So the idea being is that we would first drain all of the water from the system. We're then going to go ahead and bypass that water heater because we do not want to fill that with antifreeze. From there, we're going to come to this compartment, take off the cover. We're going to find our vacuum line, stick that directly into our bottle of antifreeze. We're gonna follow that line back. We're going to find a valve. We'll go ahead and turn that valve into the secondary position. From there, we're going to go throughout the unit. We're going to turn on all of our water fixtures, both the hot and the cold side of the plumbing. We're gonna let that run until the, to the remaining water runs out of the lines and we actually see that antifreeze at the fixture. Once we've done that to all of our water fixtures and toilet, that is going to be our indicator that we are fully winterized and we are good to go ahead and store the, uh, store the unit in freezing weather. Next up are going to be our water connections. Up top here, we have our freshwater connection that's going to correspond with the onboard water tank. Uh, not pressurized, so we do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up from that tank to the fixtures to make it usable. Uh, to fill this, of course, we remove the cap. We stick our drinking water directly in there. Fail till we are satisfied, cap it off and we are good to go. Now this is going to be our off-grid, our boondocking, uh, you know, whatever kind of connection to wh where we don't have access to full-time running water. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and use this. Now, uh, if we're in the capacity of an RV park and we uh, have access to full-time running water, we're going to use our city water connection. Now, water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about our city water connection. Uh, generally, these units are rated for a working water pressure in between 40 and 75 PSI. Oftentimes out there in the wild, you'll find water pressure upwards to 80 to 100. So it is very important that we do regulate that pressure coming into the unit. And we're going to do it with, you guessed it, a water pressure regulator. So we're going to hook this directly onto the water source or as close to the water fixture as we can get. So hook this on there. We're going to take our handy dandy drinking water hose hook that directly onto that uh, water pressure regulator. And then lastly, we will make our connection here at the camper by go ahead and rotating this 
hose connection on the camper. So right below these hose connections, we are going to find our label for our freshwater drain. If we go ahead and take a look down on the underside of the camper, we will find that uh, transitioning through the underbelly. Now that is just a cap, so we just need to go ahead and unscrew that cap. It is a gravity feed system. It may take a few minutes for that tank to empty if it is completely full, uh, but it is very easy to accomplish. And just, just to remind you that anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead and purge all of the water from the system. If we are doing so, uh, if we have used that fresh water holding tank, it is important that we do go ahead and drain it. If we haven't physically filled it up, there is no need to drain it. Next up is going to be slide out maintenance. Uh, with these units, it's very important that we get on a 90 day maintenance schedule. That's going to include uh, managing the water levels on our battery, uh, doing a structural inspection of the unit, and then of course, um, maintaining our slide out components. Uh, what we have here is going to be the Schwintec system. Uh, as you can see, you have a track here on the top and bottom of the slide out. We also have corresponding tracks on the other side. Uh, it's our goal to go ahead and lubricate these tracks again every 90 days. And to do so, we are going to utilize a, dr a dry silicone lubricant. Uh, generally, that is an aerosol product. So we're gonna go ahead and spray those tracks down. We'll run that slide in and out a few times to distribute that lubricant. And we're gonna be good to, for, good to go for the next 90 days. At that same time, we're going to go ahead and make sure we are conditioning our exterior seals here. To do so, we are going to use an RV grade seal conditioner. Uh, also does come in an aerosol can, so we will just go ahead and spray that down. Do keep in mind that this seal does wrap all the way around the slides. So we're gonna do left to right, top to bottom. Uh, we're gonna wipe off any excess, and then again, we will be good to go for the next 90 days. Next up, we're going to talk about lug nut torque and tire pressure. Uh, with any trailer, you are going to run those tires at the max tire pressure rating. You will find that either stamped on the sidewall of the tire here, or on the data tag at the driver's side front corner of the unit. For this particular unit, it's gonna be 65 PSI. So it is again going to be very important that we run those at 65 PSI. That will give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating, whether we have the unit completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is going to be a good number. And then also our lug nuts here have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. The manufacturer is going to recommend a retorque procedure uh, on your initial travels, as well as any time that you do go ahead and remove that tire for service. We can see that outlined here on the sticker. And what IBEX is going to recommend is going to be the initial 50, 100, and 200 miles. They want you to go ahead and pull over, use a torque wrench, and make sure that those are maintaining that 100 foot-pounds of torque. Do keep in mind that is not just the initial uh, retorque procedure that that is any time that that wheel is removed, either changing a tire, having a bearing pack done, or any service that may uh, require you to go ahead and remove that tire. All right, guys, everybody's favorite topic coming up next is how I dump my wastewater. So uh, what we have here a little forward is going to be our bayonet fitting. Now that is a standardized fitting throughout the RV industry. This is where we are going to make our sewage hose connection. Now we do go ahead and include a sewage hose with your purchase. Uh, this is what we would call the weekender model. It is designed to get you started, get you uh, so you can leave the dealership and go uh, right into camping, uh, not gonna last forever. Uh, when it does come to upgrade, uh, you will probably be upgrading into something slightly more substantial uh, than this, but the connection here will be exactly the same. So what we do is we have a cap here. Now this cap does need to be in place anytime uh, we are traveling down the road. We remove that cap and if we go ahead and take a look at our sewage hose, we have two keyholes here. They do correspond with uh, four prongs around the outside of that bayonet fitting. We go ahead, put the keyholes in the halfway position, give that a quarter inch turn to the right. That's going to go ahead and lock it on and get us ready to go ahead and evacuate those tanks of our wastewater. Uh, now, if we back up a little bit, we have those uh, valves here on the frame. The gray handled valve is going to be for gray water and the black water for black water, easy enough. Uh, gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. 
and black water is going to be our toilet waste, body waste, uh, toilet paper, things like that, uh, of course, are going to be in the black water tank. Uh, very important on how we operate these valves. They do need to be in the closed position. Uh, we're going to use the onboard mon monitor panel and only dump as necessary. It's also very important that those valves are not both in the open position at the same time. That's going to help, of, uh, help us avoid any cross-contamination or backfeeding in between the two systems. The very popular option is going to be once you've made your connection here at the bayonet fitting, we go ahead and pull our black water uh, valve, uh, and that is just a six inch pull straight towards you. Once that water has evacuated the tank, we're going to then close off that valve, then open up our gray water. What that's going to do is go ahead and rinse any shared plumbing between the two systems, as well as our sewage hose on the way out. Uh, once we're done, we go ahead and close that, return it to service, and start the whole process over. Here we have our cable satellite inlet. What that will allow you to do is that some of these higher end campgrounds will offer a park cable service for you. Uh, and just about every satellite provider is offering a satellite package geared towards RVers. Either way, this would be the inlet of those TV services. This is going to, of course, be a pass-through connection to the designated TV areas of the camper to allow you to go ahead and feed those services. It will go ahead and utilize a standard RG6 cable fitting. So I find most people are, again, uh, are pretty familiar with that. That is just, again, that standardized cable line. And then beside that, we have our power supply. Now, if we look here, we have our uh, power connections. We have two slanted prongs and one L-shaped. If we go ahead and take a look at our power supply, we have the corresponding, um, the corresponding shapes here. And just like when you were a kid, if you line everything up, it's going to plug straight in. We give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it on. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and secure that connection further. Now we do also include a 30 to 15 amp reducer with the unit that will be helpful if we are wanting to check the function of some low draw appliances, uh, pre-cooler refrigerator, things like that. This will allow us to go ahead and reduce that 30 amp connection to a standard 15 amp household outlet so we can again plug the unit into our garage uh, or really any 15 amp service. Now, one thing to keep in mind that this is designed for low draw appliances. If we want to go ahead and like run our air conditioner, our microwave, or anything that is going to be considered a high draw appliance, uh, it's a very good idea to upgrade this from this puck style reducer to a dog bone style, which is going to accomplish the same things. However, it will go ahead and separate the two ends by 12 inches worth of cord. It's going to help dissipate the, uh, the heat that's running those hydraulic appliances can go ahead and put off. One recommendation I do make for every unit that I deliver is going to be adding a 30 amp surge protector here in line at the power supply. Uh, the reason being is when we're taking the unit from RV park to RV park, uh, we are plugging into unknown power poles and uh, we are opening ourselves up to a certain level of vulnerability in doing so. Uh, what we're trying to manage or trying to head off is going to be not only natural surges, uh, substandard wiring, dirty power, all of those things will protect, be protected with a 30 amp surge protector. So uh, as a dealership and as a technician, I have some products that I would recommend or our parts department, I should say, has some products that they recommend. If you have any questions on what we recommend, feel free to give our parts department a call they would be more than happy to educate you on what we recommend and how to use it. All right, guys, next up we have our black tank flush. Uh, this is going to correspond with a jet inside that black water tank, and it is specifically designed to help blast off any compounded toilet waste, body waste that may, retain, may remain on the inside walls of that black water tank after we've dumped it. So what we're going to do is we are going to hook on a, a, a gar standard garden hose, any old garden hose, most dump stations will have them. Uh, of course, don't use your drinking water hose, but really any other hose would be good. Uh, so we go ahead and hook on here, and it's very important before we allow that water to rush into that black water holding tank that we do open up the blade valve. I can't stress how important that is. Uh, if you were to let water run here into the tank, uh, with that valve in the closed position, what it's going to do is overflow that tank, the path of least resistance being the rooftop septic vents. So essentially your wastewater would then 
uh, overflow from the roof line. Uh, of course, sounds like a terrible situation, so we want to make sure that we avoid that. Uh, to kind of give you kind of a real world scenario of how this will probably go, uh, as we mentioned previously, you will dump your black water holding tank first. Of course, let that evacuate fully, close that valve. We're then going to open up the gray water, do the same thing with that, close that valve when we're done. Then we would reopen up that black water valve, make our connection here. Of course, rinse that tank until we are satisfied. Now, I gave you the recommendation of probably upgrading that hose or uh, your, your dump or your sewage hose uh, at some point. When you do so, it's not a bad idea to pick one with a clear elbow. What that will allow you to do is when utilizing this black tank flush, you can go ahead and rinse that tank until you see that water run clear to give you kind of a further understanding uh, of the level of cleanliness within that tank. At the rear of the unit, not too terribly much that we need to speak of. Of course, we have our rooftop ladder access. This is going to have a weight rating of 250 pounds. Uh, so let's make sure we're not exceeding that. Uh, we are going to, of course, utilize this to do our rooftop inspections. Uh, now, previously mentioned, we are going to be inspecting uh, this unit 360 degrees every 90 days. So what that's going to include is, of course, crawling up there on the roof. Uh, we're going to be checking anywhere where two pieces come together and maintaining the seals that uh, bond those two things together. So. Uh, up on the roof, they're going to utilize a self-leveling lap sealant. So if we see any degradation in that sealant, uh, any cracking, peeling, separation of any kind, we're going to use a self-leveling lap sealant and touch up any problem areas as necessary. Now, that's not something that uh, you are going to have to be very precise in doing. Uh, the nature of the product is going to allow you to kind of apply with a heavy hand and it's going to go ahead and puddle over any problem areas. Uh, on the body, we are going to go ahead and generally find a 100% silicone product. It looks like mostly of what they're using on this particular camper is just going to be some standard clear silicone. If we do again see any degradation in those seals, we're going to go ahead and remove that bead and relay it, uh, smooth it out, uh, get it as clean as we can. Uh, and again, we're going to do that inspection every 90 days. Probably won't have to touch anything up for the first few inspections. Uh, but as the camper ages, the more trips you go on, things are going to go ahead and move uh, and you will find separation at some time. The most important thing is that we do go ahead and uh, stop that in its tracks. Make sure we touch up any problem areas before we have any water intrusion. Dead center here, we have our Fearon backup camera pre-wire. Now what Ibex has done as they went ahead and did all the legwork for you to go ahead and add that camera at a later date. It's very easy to do so, a very customer friendly uh, installation. All you need to do is go ahead and remove the four screws that hold that kind of dummy panel on and then we'll go ahead and plug our camera in, replace those four screws and we'll be good to go. Uh, now one thing to keep in mind is that this camera does get power anytime the lights are on so that's going to extend your rear view uh, from not only when you're reversing, but any time that you wish to have a view of the back of your camera. What we're going to recommend when changing a tire is that we go ahead and jack the unit up directly from the axle. So we're going to go ahead and place that jack on the axle as close to the tire that we are changing without it interfering in our work. We're going to go ahead and of course jack the unit up from that position, do any work that we need to on the tire. Now do keep in mind if we do change a tire, whether it be the spare tire and then uh, subsequently the uh, putting the, the standard tire back into service, we do need to restart that retorque procedure. So once we put the spare tire on, we would then uh, retorque those lugs 50, 100, 200 miles. And then when we get our tire replaced or repaired, we're then gonna do that all over again. So keep that in mind. Here we are at the entry door of the unit. Um, first things first is we are going to go ahead and demo these steps here for you. Uh, these self-supporting steps are kind of all of the rage uh, these days in the RV industry. We're seeing more and more units come standard with them. They are a great feature to the unit. Um, so we see them in the down position. Uh, if we go ahead and open this door, and this is pretty important, this door does need to be fully open or the uh, steps will go ahead and catch on the actual door. 
and we just go ahead and lift into uh, that stowed position. We're gonna make sure that we pull this blue handle out and it will lock there in between the door frame. Now, once we've done that, that's going to kind of give us a good view of our adjustment. It's a little hard to get on camera when they're down, but you also see here that you have uh, adjustments there on the legs to allow you to go ahead and make up for any variances in ground grade and things like that. So they are pretty much ultimately adjustable uh, and will fit nicely into any situation that you put them into. Uh, with that being said, we can go ahead and close the door and that will allow us to go ahead and take a look at our assist handle. Now this is going to lock in that extended position or outward position. And then if we go ahead and fold it across the door, uh, that's going to be the stowed position. I have a lot of people ask or, or you know, worry that somebody may come by and lock them into their camper at night. Now this does not lock into that position. So what that means is that if somebody were to do that and you opened up your door, it's going to go ahead and push that handle back out. So that's not something you have to worry about. To the right of the entry door, you are going to find your trailer bound spray port. This is an excellent addition. Uh, what this is going to do is allow you to, of course, tap into your water supply. Uh, outside showers are fairly common throughout these units. This is kind of a variant of that. This is, of course, going to utilize this blue hose in my hand. Of course, why else would I be holding it? But uh, it also is going to utilize a quick connect fitting. Uh, what we have here is a locking collar that we can slide back, uh, insert the male end fully. But once we've went ahead and made that connection with that quick connect, that hose is going to go ahead and self-pressurize, and then when you're ready, you have <laughs> the ability to go ahead and use it. <laughs> Moving on, we have a couple 15 amp outlets here. Uh, what that will allow us to do is, of course, when we're out here enjoying the space, we have the awning, things like that. Uh, we can power some uh, secondary appliances or devices out here while we're enjoying this space. What we have here on the exterior of the unit is going to be the flapper for our vent hood. Um, the biggest thing with that is we do need to make sure that we open that up before prepping a meal on that cooktop. And we do want to make sure we close it before going down the road. That's going to help keep any road debris, uh, weather, things like that out from inside the camper. Uh, and this particular one is just a friction fit. So uh, if you go ahead and physically stick your hand under there, that's going to open it. And then when you want to close it, you just go ahead and push it closed uh, and it will be held into place by the friction of the fasteners. Next up here, we have our furnace exhaust vent. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this is going to blow very hot air well on, uh, and we do not want to restrict the flow of this appliance. So no lawn chairs in front of it, nothing like that. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is not only here with the furnace, but all of our propane appliances is that you do want to make sure that we are protecting those from the intrusion of mud daubers, flying insects, things like that. To do so, we're going to go ahead and utilize some aftermarket bug screens to do so. And we're going, again going to outfit all of our propane appliances with those aftermarket bug screens. And then next up is going to be our water heater here. Uh, first things first is if we go ahead and take a look here back behind the propane regulator here, we do have an on-off toggle switch. Uh, what that is going to do is turn on the 110 volt heating element of the appliance. Uh, now this also will run on propane with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, you can use both sources if you're inclined to do so. That's going to give you the highest recharge rate or you can feel free to use those as they present themselves. Again, you're going to find the 110 volt switch here at the water heater, but we'll find the propane switch on the inside of the unit. Now the manufacturer is going to have some very specific recommendations on how to maintain this safely and properly. Uh, biggest thing with that is anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead and drain the water heater separate of the rest of the systems. And from a safety standpoint, it's important that we do that properly so we don't hurt ourselves. Uh, first things first that we're going to do is make sure that we go ahead and let this cool a lot longer than you may think. Generally, I will recommend my customers to go ahead and let that sit overnight. Once we've done so, we need to go ahead and depressurize the water heater. To do so, we're going to cut the overall inflow of water to the unit as a whole. So if we're running off of that city water connection, that's as easy as turning the water off at the valve. 
And if we are using the 12 volt water pump, we do just need to go ahead and flip that switch into the off position. So once we've went ahead and cut the water circulating throughout the unit off, we then need to depressurize it. To do so, we're going to go to the hot side of any fixture. We're gonna go ahead and open that fixture up. And what we're going to see there is maybe a little steam, just very little bit of water. And what we're doing is essentially just breaking the seal here at the water heater and depressurizing it. So once we've done all of those things, we're going to come back to the water heater with an inch and a 16th socket and ratchet. And we will go ahead and back our drain plug here. You're going to see the remaining five and a half, six gallons of water evacuate the tank from that location. Now, once we've done so, we're good to go ahead and store the unit. Now, on the flip side of that conversation, when we are returning the unit back to service, it's important that we do go ahead and prime or pump six gallons of water into the water heater before we go ahead and start heating that. Uh, to do so, we're of course firstly going to replace our drain plug. Once we've done so, we are going to repressurize the unit as a whole, turn the city water connection on if we're utilizing that, flip that water pump switch on if we're going to go ahead and use that. And once we've done that, we're again going to go to the hot side of any water fixture. What we're going to see this time is going to be slightly different from when we are depressurizing the unit. We're going to, number one, see a lot more water, but we're also going to see a lot more air. That flow at the fixture is going to be very spitty and interrupted. Uh, what it's doing is it is, of course, displacing the air that has now filled the tank and replacing it with water. It takes about five or so minutes for the, uh, the water system to work out that air from the tank. Once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is our indicator that we can go ahead and start heating our water uh, again, with whichever source that we prefer. Uh, also, one thing that I have not mentioned is that we do have our uh, anode rod, and that is our, our drain plug, I should say, pulls double duty. It is also our anode rod. What an anode rod, do uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto the end of the anode rod as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, and they eat away at that anode rod. So it is a consumable part. I generally will see our customers get a season or two of camping before that anode rod needs to be replaced. Starts out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. By the time it needs to be replaced, it's going to be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit. Make sure that when we go ahead and uh, replace this, that we go ahead and save our old one. We take that into the RV supplier of our choice and they will go ahead and outfit us with the correct size for this particular water heater. Also, um, we do have some openings here on the front cover and we do want to go ahead and make sure we are protecting them again from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. As you can see, we have the outside kitchen area here. Uh, what that's going to include is going to be a propane powered griddle and then we have a shelf here as well uh, in case we want to go ahead and you know need some more space for food prep, things like that. Now this cooktop here is going to utilize this secondary propane line and quick connect, con quick connect connection. And to access that, we're going to go uh, down below here and we can see that on the frame and just like any other quick connect we slide that locking collar back we go ahead and insert our mail in until it snaps and we have a valve here we need to open up so we're going to go ahead and do that at this time we're then going to take the other end of our hose there and plug that into the grill uh, again utilizing that quick connect and you may need to kind of support this while we make that connection. Once we've done that, we'll open up this valve as well. And coming back top side here, um, when it goes to light this, we remove the cooktop momentarily. Good thing we have a shelf there for that. Uh, and what we're going to do is use the knob here to go ahead and activate that, that gas flow as well as the sparker. So we hold this in like we're lighting any other pilot we're going to go ahead and rotate counterclockwise. And if we were to go ahead and do that for a spell, we would eventually go ahead and see this burner assembly go ahead and light up. Now, once we've done so, we're gonna hold this in for a few seconds and make sure that thermal coupler has some time to heat up and then it will stay on on its own accord 
and we can go ahead and adjust the intensity of our flame to where we like it. Once we're happy with it, we go ahead and take our griddle top and put it back on. Um, that's very easy to do or very simple. And it is also very simple to go ahead and remove this stuff for storage. So what we're going to do is again, we're going to lift the cooktop out of place. And as you can see, we have a bracket here that is, is uh, hanging on a rail installed onto the camper. And we're gonna go ahead and remove the grill from that bracket. So to do so, we remove these cotter pins that are holding that in place. This, we wanna disconnect our propane line, I guess, before we remove that. And once we've done so, this is just going to easily lift off. Now, kind of a pro tip, when we go to store this, it's very, it will store better, I should say, if you take your griddle, flip that upside down, and sit it on top of that grill like so. From there, these very easily lift off on that trailer mounted rail. Uh, they do have these spring clips, so you push these in and those legs are gonna go ahead and fold flat for you. Allow you to go ahead and store all of this stuff nice and easy. We then go ahead and remove our uh, shelf here. And again, we see that kick out leg that will fold nice and flat for you. Next up is going to be on the other side of our pass-through storage compartment. Only other new thing or thing worth noting here is that we do have our inverter located in this compartment and uh, not really much that you'll have to control on the inverter that is auxiliary switch. But the reason for bringing it up is make sure that the things that we are keeping in this compartment are not gonna damage that inverter in any way. Um, other than that, I think that just about covers it here on the exterior of the Ibex. Let's go on the inside and take a look at that. So first things first is we have our switch cluster right inside the door. Uh, this is going to control not only some uh, interior and exterior lights, but also our awning and slide out controls are going to be on this cluster. First up is going to be our awning controls. If I go ahead and extend that, we can see that awning come out. Um, one thing to note about that, I'm not of course going to put the awning fully out, but one thing worth mentioning is that it does not stop in that extended position. So you're going to have to, uh, once you go ahead and see that um, run out of kind of fabric and that ballast, go ahead and drop down. Uh, make sure that we go ahead and remove our finger from that button if we were to hold that down, it's actually going to start to retract in backwards. Uh, so that's of course what we want to avoid uh, for the longevity of that awning fabric and components. And then we have our slide room in and out switch. Now with the Schwintex system, we have two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. Uh, what that means for us when it does come to using it, that we do need to make sure that we avoid short bursts or partial openings. So if we are uh, pushing the slide out, we want to make sure we're going fully out, same on the way in. And then next up is going to be our LED awning light. Uh, as you can see, that corresponds with a set of LEDs across the uh, base of the awning to go ahead and light up that porch area. And then we also have a porch light switch here uh, that will go ahead and light that space up further. Now we do have a couple of options. This is a three-way switch, uh, middle positioning being off. Uh, upward position being a bright white LED, and then the downward position being a amber colored bug light. And then we have our main interior light switch here, uh, which is going to control the overhead lights, uh, most of the overhead lights, I should say. Now keep in mind that each light is going to have a push button on off switch on the actual fixture, so we can further control which ones come on and off with that main switch. Uh, below that, we have a couple utensil holders and a bottle opener as well. Some pretty cool accoutrements to the unit. Uh, if we go ahead and switch gears here and take a look at our refrigerator. Now, this is a Norcold 12, uh, Norcold 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. This is going to take the place of the standard kind of ammonia absorption uh, refrigerators that you generally find throughout the units. The whole kind of... Um, industry is going this way this is kind of going to be the future of rv refrigerators uh, and we see a good example of that here in the ibex uh, standard on off switch here so if we go ahead and hold that on we get the indicator light here that we are actually on next up is going to be our temperature controls 
Uh, one thing that kind of differentiates this from other, uh, not only 12 volt compressor style refrigerators, but most ammonia absorption refrigerators is that you can set a separate temperature uh, for your freezer to your refrigerator. So first one up is going to be our freezer controls. And then the next button is going to be our refrigerator controls. I believe you have one through five in terms of temperature adjustment there. Of course, five being the coldest, one being the warmest. And then we have a night mode here. Uh, what that night mode is going to do is essentially put it in like a uh, eco mode or it's going to run more efficiently overnight. Uh, they take into account that you're not going to be, of course, opening and closing the door at night. So it will be able to run at a lower power consumption and still maintain uh, that temperature. As we see here on the interior of the fridge, of course, not much uh, different than we would be used to seeing. You have a couple adjustable shelves and a cusp, uh, adjustable uh, racks and things like that. But other than that, it is just going to be uh, pretty standard on the inside. All right, guys, here in the restroom, uh, first things first is going to be our switch clusters uh, one being our overhead light. And again, that light does have a switch directly on the fixture. Uh, if for whatever reason, you don't want to use the switch on the wall. Next up is our heated holding tank system. Now these switches are going to correspond with a little heating pad uh, on each of those tanks designed specifically for cold weather camping um, to keep those tanks from freezing. So uh, these are on lighted switches to let you know that they are on. Other than that, if you are camping in inclement weather, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and use these tank heaters. And then beside that, we have our convenience center, water pump controls, and propane water heater switch. Uh, now, just a moment here about your tank monitors. These are going to give you a real-time readout of the level of your tanks. Uh, if we take a look here at the scale, the more lights we see, the fuller that particular tank we are evaluating is going to be. And then also we have an indicator here for our battery. Now our battery is going to remain full any or indicate full anytime we are plugged into shore power. To get a true readout of where our battery sits in level of full, we do need to go ahead and unplug from shore power and go ahead and test here at the display. And then below that, we have our water pump switch. Again, that's going to pressurize that freshwater tank, draw that water up to the fixtures and make it usable when we are boondocking or running off grid. And then beside that, we have the propane switch or the propane source uh, for our water heater. And when we go ahead and turn that on, we're gonna see this fault light comes on with that switch. Now that fault light is ultimately our indicator on whether or not the appliance has lit or not. So. The appliance will cycle three times. If it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it's gonna go ahead and illuminate that fault light and quit trying. Uh, the reason why it may not light is generally a couple of things. Either your propane cylinder is empty, either you have not opened up the service valve on top of your propane cylinder, or oftentimes the propane has not made its way through the lines to the appliance to allow it to fire up. So. Uh, in the event that that happens, just make sure you have gas in the tank, make sure that it is, uh, of course, open. And if we think that the propane hasn't made its way to the appliance, we very easily just turn the switch off, turn it back on. It will cycle another three times. If the issue has been resolved, it will generate light on the first try of the second cycle. Next up here is going to be our solar charge controller. This is going to be like an information center as well as the brains behind the solar system. So basically just a information center that will allow us to go ahead and evaluate what we're taking in solar. Uh, always kind of working in the background. So there's not really, there's no on off switch. There's nothing that you really have to do. It's going to take advantage of solar kind of in the background. Next up, we're going to talk about the operation of your toilet. This is a pedal style flush. It will be a light press here on the pedal on the floor to fill up that bowl. Uh, not a bad idea to keep water in the bowl. Uh, what that's going to do is help keep those bad smells down when you flush. Uh, and then when we flush, we just push that pedal to the floor. Now do keep in mind that any toilet treatments, uh, whether that be uh, chemical deodorizer, tissue dissolver, uh, sensor cleaner, all of that is generally introduced right here at the toilet. Number one, we're going to of course follow the uh, manufacturer of the specific product we're using, uh, instructions on how to use them, but 
90% of them are going to be introduced here at the toilet. And then if I turn around here, of course, we have a, a hand washing sink, medicine cabinet. This is all pretty uh, standard stuff. And um, my favorite shower on the market is going to be these corner showers with the glass doors. Uh, one thing that this unit has different from many units is going to be the Thermister uh, system installed. We can see that underneath the shower head there. Uh, what that allows you to do is uh, specifically if you are boondocking, it will allow you to go ahead and conserve as much wastewater as possible. Um, by doing so, it's going to allow you to circulate water through the freshwater system. And what, what you're doing is, is you're not waiting for that water to get hot or from the water to make its way from the water heater to the shower uh, which can take you know a minute or so so what you're going to do is you're going to turn this knob here into the secondary position once we've done so that's going to again circulate that water and what we're going to ultimately be looking for is this will turn from this blue to like a gray color once the hot water has reached the fixture and then at that point we would go ahead and return that back to our normal mode and we have instant hot water at the fixture and we haven't wasted any water getting to there uh, other than that, here on the fixture, you're going to see an on-off head that will, uh, an on-off switch on the head that will allow us to further conserve water consumption. Uh, generally, with these units, um, you know, six-gallon hot water tank. Uh, if you're doing some true boondocking, uh, it, we want to make sure that we're not wasting water. So what you'll find yourself doing is military navy-style showers. Uh, turning that water on and off multiple times throughout that shower again to go ahead and, and help make sure that you don't waste any water um, Other than that we have these doors these slider doors uh, They will go ahead and utilize this kind of bungee lock system to keep those from moving around too much while we're going down the road on the underside of the cabinetry here We have a light switch uh, what that's going to do is you have this kind of spice rack um you know back here and that's just going to kind of light that space give it kind of a, a modern look and then we have a couple usbs there for charging here in the kitchen area uh, moving further into that kitchen area we have our hood vent here of course as you expect it has a light and a fan as most do and then we have our uh, Dometic cook or excuse me suburban cooktop here. This is kind of going to be their base model no sparker or igniter So we do need to go ahead and keep a long stem barbecue lighter with the unit We're going to utilize that to go ahead and of course light the burners to do so We just go ahead and turn to light here once we've done that We don't have to push it down or hold it down or anything that propane is flowing We're going to go ahead and take our lighter and put our flame right there on the burner until we see that uh, flame from there we can go ahead and adjust our temperature and intensity from either high or low All right next up we have our farmhouse style sink uh, of course nothing too crazy uh, it, The styling is very nice, but it is going to function as you're used to a couple different spray modes here uh, That sink or sprayer will go ahead and pull out or extend uh, And then of course you have a hot and cold here at the fixture under the refrigerator We are going to find our WIFCO converter uh, this is going to house not only our 110 volt breakers, but also our 12 volt automotive replaceable blade style fuses. We're going to find those on the right side labeled here on the door. Now it's going to be my recommendation that you do go ahead and pick up a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. If you do not have a spare, you will probably inevitably need one. So let's make sure we have uh, a spare in all of these numbers. And then we have our resettable uh, 110 volt light switch style breaker. Same variant you're going to find in your breaker box at home. And again, we have those labeled in terms of function right there on the door. Now, if we kind of switch gears here, we want to take a look here at our fire extinguisher. Uh, one thing to mention is that uh, we do want to check this every single time we take the unit out. We have a little gauge here. We want to inspect that gauge. Make sure this has pressure that way in the event that we need that on our camping trip that it is going to be in good working order. Now that's not only going to go for the fire extinguisher, it's also going to go for all of our other safety equipment including our smoke alarm, carbon monoxide, and LP leaks detector. When you look here at the next appliance you may say, hey man, that's a microwave. But it's so much more than that. It's actually a convection oven, a grill, 
as well as a microwave. So when it comes to using it, it's going to be very, um, you know, indicative of a microwave. You're going to have your modes here up at the top. So we have convection, grill, roast, uh, power levels, and defrost. We have a couple presets there. And then down below is going to be our time and temperature, start and stop, just like a microwave. And when we go ahead and open up the door, we're going to see our turntable as we would normally see, but we're also going to see our uh, convection rack as well. And then if we look at the very top, you'll find a heating element as well to allow you to go ahead and operate that like an oven. Uh, so really, really, really cool appliance. These work exceptionally well. Uh, they take a they take the place of an oven here of they take the place of an oven here in the RV. Uh, and they are definitely suitable to do so. Uh, and then we have our road vac system below that. This is going, can be operated two ways. Uh, we have a hose attachment option here. Now the unit does not come standard with that hose. If you wanna go ahead and add that, just go ahead and contact road vac and they'll set you up. We do have an on off switch here to turn that hose attachment on. And then if we look here, we have our kind of dustpan option as well. Uh, what that means for you is you could go ahead and use any old broom, sweep our debris towards the unit, and then if we were to open that up, that's going to go ahead and turn on and suck that debris right up there into the orifice. Now, when it does come to changing our bag, this, of course, runs on a standard sweeper bag. It's very easy to do so. We have a little hole here for our finger. If we stick our finger in there and pull towards us, that's going to go ahead and pivot out. Uh, we can of course see that bag in there. Now that bag connects to the rear of the unit as well as to the front here. So make sure that we have a connection on both of those uh, spots. Now do make sure that when we fill this bag up that we take note of the size of the bag we need. That way we can easily replace it. Um, when seating this back, um, it can be a little finicky, but we just need to make sure we line up uh, the prongs here on the left side. Go ahead and pull that with our finger again. That's going to go ahead and seat flush there. And then if I back up a little bit more, we can see our furnace blower motor. Uh, now this is going to correspond with the thermostat and we're getting ready to talk about that. But do keep in mind it's not a ducted system. So all of our heat from the unit or throughout the unit is going to come from this one central location. While we're sitting here enjoying this very comfortable jackknife sofa, it's a perfect time to go ahead and talk about our air excel thermostat this is going to utilize a single mode button here down at the bottom and then up or down uh, arrows to control the temperature again this thermostat is not only going to control the furnace but also the air conditioner so we can go ahead here through the modes first up our options are going to be just a standard air conditioner fan speed uh, you know just just a circulation fan uh, nothing more we do have a couple speeds there for that next up is going to actually take us into our air conditioner settings again we have a couple options there for the fan we have a a set high and a set low fan speed and then we also have those high and low fans with the auto subcategory what that means is that if we go into that 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 fan speed with that auto subcategory that it's going to go ahead and reach this 73 degrees and the unit will shut down completely if we go to either the straight or higher or low, the straight higher or low options, uh, that fan is going to continue to run even once we've hit this 73 degrees. Last but not least, our last mode of operation is going to be the furnace. Um, so once we kick that on, that blower motor is going to kick on almost immediately. 16 seconds after that, it will ignite. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. And units of this size, it's not overly surprising if it actually does kick off that smoke alarm within the first 15 minutes of operation. That is completely acceptable per the manufacturer of the furnace. Uh, what's happening is it's bur burning off any dust or debris on the actual unit. Uh, it's not running as, efficient, as efficiently as it soon will. Uh, so in the event that that happens, of course, just silence that smoke alarm, uh, let that run for 15 minutes and it will correct itself. And then if we take a look down here at the floor, we have our safety alert carbon monoxide LP leak detector. This is a very important piece of our safety equipment and you guessed it, we test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. So this does have a single button on it that is going to be our test button. So what we're gonna do is just push that in. It'll give us an audible tone. You may see some flashing lights on there. 
uh, that's going to let us know that it is working correctly and we are good to go. We're going to go over how you go ahead and utilize the jackknife sofa. So what we do is of course get these cushions out of here and then it's as easy as lifting from the bottom and pushing from the top and that's going to go ahead and lay down flat give you a secondary sleeping area for you. Now also while we're talking about that couch we're going to talk about how you stow your table away uh, for transport. So if we take a look here at the table we will see that there is a release mechanism here. It's going to correspond with this yellow tab. Uh, we can hear that kind of unlock. And then generally it's easier if you kind of put your knee or you know your foot down on the base uh, because it is loaded with some tension there. That tabletop will uh, swing down for you. And if we go ahead and flip that up onto the couch, we can see that we have a strap here. Of course, the corresponding strap is going to come through the bottom of the couch cushions here and strap that down, keep that from moving around on you when you're going down the road. Cool thing uh, that you're going to find here in this cabinetry is going to be this lock box. Uh, what that's going to do is allow you to lock any valuables away within the unit. Now that is going to utilize your door key, uh, one key system throughout the Ibex. Our TV here is going to be buckled in for transport. Uh, that's to keep it from rattling loose. If we go ahead and unbuckle that, we can see that it will go ahead and swing out here into the common areas of the camper will allow us to kind of position that for our needs. With that TV moved out of position, that is going to go ahead and expose our antenna booster. Uh, now this booster corresponds with a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna on the roof line. And what that's going to allow us to do is take advantage of any digital programming that we may find out there in the wild. Uh, what we'll do is if this red light is on, we're going to go through the prompts on the television and do a channel search. It will uh, seek out our best signal and bring any over the air programming dependent on that signal. So it's a cool feature. Uh, and then what we also see here is going to be our 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle. This is a 12 volt television. What that will also allow us to do is go ahead and not only watch um, TV off on grid, but off grid as well. Here we're going to find our air box to our Coleman mock air conditioner. Uh, reason for bringing this up is it does have some filters that will need to be serviced. Uh, you have a filter here on each side of the unit. If we go ahead and uh, get our fingers, and this can be a little tough, you just need to kind of pop it out. Uh, once you've done that, you can see that this filter, uh, if you can get your fingernail underneath of it, will just go ahead and pull out. Uh, idea being is that you can go ahead and rinse this off in the sink, let it dry, and then go ahead and replace it and you are back in business. Next up here we have our 9 volt smoke alarm. Um, we're going to of course test this every single time we take the unit out, like I haven't said that three times already. But um, very important again that our safety equipment is in working condition. We can see that it does run on a 9 volt battery. It's going to be my ultimate recommendation that you do keep a spare 9 volt battery with the unit. In the event this were to start indicating a low battery, uh, maybe in the middle of the night or something like that, uh, you don't want to have to remove that battery so you can get some sleep. So make sure we do have a spare battery uh, to replace if necessary. And then coming here into the bedroom, um, we have this back cabinet lighting. We can see that on off switch here. And then these lights are not going to correspond with the overhead light. Uh, we're going to go ahead and use the uh, switch right there on the fixture. We have of course storage on either side of the bed. We're also going to have some storage underneath the bed. We have some struts there that are going to aid in keeping that bed in the uh, upward position. A very efficient use of space down there on the underside. Here we are on the passenger side bed space. Uh, we do find our main GFI outlet down here. Now you do have a set of receptacles on each side of the bed. It's important to note that this is our main GFI, so all of the uh, other receptacles are on the same circuit as this guy here. If any of them were to get overloaded, this is going to go ahead and be the reset point. Um, so just making sure we're taking note of the position of that switch in the event that uh, we do have uh, any power loss or anything like that. And then down below here we have our down below here we have our inverter switch. 
it is just going to be a push button switch here to go ahead and turn that inverter on. What that inverter will do is allow us to take advantage of some receptacles uh, running off of the battery. All right, guys, that just about takes care of our walkthrough here on the Ibex 19 QBS. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any further questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to comment below. We really hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Really? This place isn't big enough for two wannabe cowboys. Spray port. The mud daubers and flying insects. Keep it. <laughs>